You alright guys? I'm the world around you and this is Pause for Thought on Threshold FM. Fucking risky territory this week, innit? Because we're going to be taking a deep dive, like a literal deep dive as well into the Pacific Ocean. As we pat around on the dark sea floor for traces of ancient Lima and prove once and for all that Lemuria is in fact a real place. Now I don't know what's happening with me at the minute but I seem to be getting sort of sucked towards theosophy a lot recently like Helena Blavatsky and all that and I've not actually read any of her stuff and that but I find in all of that side of the world very interesting all that sort of stuff is fucking fascinating so maybe that's it's going to turn into something maybe this will be part of a series I, I don't know I've not really planned out for next week I had a show planned for this week but I haven't had the time to it's going to include it's going to involve listening to about 300 songs to try and find the hidden message in them all so that's going to be a challenge um that's going to be one I'm going to have to work on for a few few weeks I think so I've only got through about I think 70 of the songs and so far haven't really found the hidden message but like I say this week it's all about Lemuria or Lemuria, Lemuria, I'm going to go probably for Lemuria, even though it's it's spelled L-E-M-U-R-I-A, but Lemuria, a lost continent that's been swallowed up by the Indian Ocean, so made a mistake a minute ago, straight off the bat, when I said we're going to take a deep dive into the Pacific Ocean, we're actually taking a dive into the, the Indian Ocean, anyway, We've already messed up, so let's have a song. We'll get straight into this. This is off Shot Yora's brand new EP, The Teller, and it's called Dave's Dilemma. I think it's a tune, mate. It was a hard one to research this, Lemuria, because there's around 100 years where no one, I, literally no one figuratively touches it. No one has touched it, literally mine, for around 34 million years, give or take a few hundred thousand years either way, but that's even if it did exist at all. Now, the fella that brought it into the forefront was this guy called Philip Sclatter, which I'm probably going to say wrong because I want to say Scalter, but it's, it's definitely Sclatter. In 1864, you see, now, this man seemingly was obsessed with lemurs as well. Like, that's the whole reason Lemuria has its name, literally deriving it from lemurs as, as Lemuria was said to be the land bridge that connected Madagascar and India, finally explaining to the long-standing uh, mystery seekers, if you like, the the, the people that were, exp uh, not experimenting, but researching evolution, basically. It would hopefully explain to them how lemurs were in India and on Madagascar, despite there being a massive fucking puddle in the middle. Now, the reason people were obsessed with this is because the lemurs seem to have evolved separately, as many creatures of Madagascar seem to have done, like you've got them ones that look like little hedgehogs, but in fact they're just mice with spines, you know. Yeah, they, they, they share genetic information anyway, so it's probably worth saying that evolution was making its rounds at the time, and science was beginning to be swept up with it. Science, or, or at least modern science, was warming to the ideas of evolution, but people love a good story, so I think the, one of the best ways to look at it is the 1800s always sort of seems to me like the sort of tween years of the modern human race, so you're like sort of 11 and 12, maybe 10 and a half, you know. We've not quite hit the aggressive teenage years of the first half of the 20th century, but, you know, we're on our way. We're arguing back with the teacher and we're making fun of the camp kid in the class, but we're not quite fingering girls or fighting with our friend's dads quite yet. We're not we're not there yet, but, you know, humanity's on its way. Weirdly, though, these teenage years of modern history, 1912 to be exact, is the moment when Lemuria went under, in, in scientific terms at least, not when it sank, but when it, when it sort of disappeared from the the general... I think zeitgeist is the wrong word. What's the word I mean? The the general mind of the of science, the scientific mind or whatever, you know, it it, it fucking people disregard it anyway. All because of some bloke that was called Alfred Wigner. Wegener? Alfred Wegener. And his theory of continental drift. Now he came up with the the just as wild assumption as, as wild as Lemuria existing. I would say possibly wilder, really. That continents move around, which if you take it at face value seems just as weird as the idea of a continent being sank underneath a sea or an ocean. Now, what I don't understand is that there aren't many people who dispute the idea of a big flood. It's backed up in historical texts, albeit religious historical texts, but also mainstream science, as scientists believe that when ice gets warm, it melts. 
My science teacher at school would also regularly tell us that magic doesn't exist and that something has to go somewhere. It can't just be nowhere. It can be anywhere, but it can't not be there. Things don't just disappear. So this water, where did that come from? Because it doesn't make sense to me that there was just ice present on the earth for millennia. Then suddenly it started to melt. But according to some stuff I've been reading, that is entirely possible. They believe it took billions of years for the earth to tilt on its axis and that this alone could be responsible for a water escaping its icy prison. But what caused that earth to tilt? Well, not that earth. What caused our earth, earth to tilt? What if the water and the tilt came to be at the same time? What if the planet doesn't tilt at all? Because I, I don't understand how a ball can be said to tilt if it's in place with no up or down to begin with. Like, where's up in space? Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's most likely just a lie that we tell ourselves in order to answer the questions of children so that adults don't seem stupid in, in the kids' eyes because... Realistically, you know, as soon as kids realise that barely any adult actually has an answer to anything the world, like, throws at them, like, adults know nothing. I'm an adult and I, I don't know much at all, as you can tell by the first, what, what's this, first ten minutes of this? I, I, I know fuck all, but as soon as kids realise that that's everyone across the board, mate, we're fucked. It's all over. Maybe it's our duty as adults to lie to the children. I've never been one to tell lies though, I don't think that kids appreciate it, I, w I won't tell my kids, if I do have kids, I'm not going to tell them about Father Christmas, I'm not going to tell them about the Easter Bunny, I I'm also not going to tell them about the time that the mother was pretty, just facts, I'm only ever going to give the kid facts, I bought your gifts, I bought the chocolate, your mother was never pretty, do you think she'd let me do the things that we we do together if she knew that she was a looker? Always shoot them down, lad. Aim low. Go for the ugly girls. There's two types of people in a relationship, lad. The lover and the loved. Always strive to be the loved. No one wants the ugly, sweaty girl at school. Now, see, lad, that's your opening. Don't lead with that, though, lad. Lie to the woman. Tell her she's beautiful. Make her feel nice. And that's how I treat this show, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing but the truth. So, who were the inhabitants of this long-lost land? The Lemurians, which isn't hard to believe because, you know, we've got Europeans, we've got Africans, we've got Americans, we've got Asians. So, why not have the Lemurians as well? Perfectly logical. Now, the Lemurians were also supposed to be the ancestors of not only the Lemur, but of the human race too. Having been knocking about approximately 34 and a half million years ago, at the same time it's noted as Velociraptors and the Brachiosaurus, hard to imagine how we survived at all really, innit? Until you pay attention to the fact and you remember that our ancestors, the Lemurians, had four arms each, and each one of them stood at least 15 feet tall, like a uh, fucking oversized Goro from fucking Mortal Kombat. But a time period isn't the only things our ancestors shared with the dinosaurs of that time. The first three so-called sub-races of the Lemurians, sub-races is a thing that I think we'll, I'll explain what that is in a little bit, uh, it's not like a, a derogatory term, it's just what the, theosophical people, the, theosoph theosogians, theologians, maybe, I've heard the word theologians before, maybe that's what it means, but it's, it's not a derogatory term or anything, I'll just get into it in a bit, it gets a little bit puzzle that'll probably be an episode all on its own uh, anyway the the first three sub races of lemurians they were also oviparous of of oviparous oviparous there's a lot of words this week guys a lot of words with a lot of vowels and my accent don't really allow for it either way that word means that they laid eggs to reproduce now I'm not sure if the Lemurians were like Godzilla in the sense that they could fertilize their own eggs or if they needed to make love like uh, an octopus or your fucking average donkey there doesn't seem to be much record of any of this like no there's no drawings there's no pictures there's no etchings there's no recreations there's there's no not even any short stories telling us how the lemurians made love to each other like was it a passionate affair was it a violent affair was it was everyone into it was was it more of a chore was it they had one lemurian that would breed amongst loads of female lemurians or was it, you know, the other way round for whatever reason? That doesn't really... I mean, maybe the strongest sperm would survive, but it seems counterproductive to have, like, you know, 15 men breed with one woman because she's only going to get... Unless maybe they could hatch out batches of eggs, maybe. Fuck knows. I honestly don't know. Like I say, there's, 
I couldn't find any videos or pictures or anything like that to to learn from. Um, but this kind of ties some stuff together. Like from a religious standpoint, there are or there were a species of giants known as the Nephilim, a giant race of humanoid. And there's also indications of giants from ancient Egypt too. And if you remember back to the giant episode, there were giants all around the world at one point or another. So what if the giants, modern humans and the water that covers Lemuria can all be connected what if an asteroid or a spaceship frozen in a piece of ice hit the Earth one day, right? And and, and then with it hit with such a force that the Earth tilted on its axis, the ice melted away because it's now leaning ever so closer to the sun. But what if the moon is simply just that you know that when you see a picture of a when you see someone's photograph or illustration of a spaceship, spaceships always have that little ball in the middle in it, right? So what if the moon is simply that middle ball of a spaceship, like you, you know what the bit, the bit I mean, isn't it? Where you always see the little, the little grey man waving or whatever, and inside there is the DNA splicing facility or a laboratory, you know, a laboratory that that, is, that we've alluded to in the past in other episodes. You know, we keep bringing it up. Maybe it's true, but there's more. There's 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 a lot more. So, uh, so my my theory and and that's uh, like that's I say there's a lot more. That's that's all realistically in my imagination, and and not actually the theory of, of Philip Sclat- Sclatter. We've we've actually learnt less uh, than what I'd intended to. All all I've done is muddy the waters. Anyway, we'll get back into what what we know. So the forearms and fifteen foot tall humanoids seem to stem from an idea from Helena Helena Blavatsky. Now, I, I, like I said at the start of the show, I want to learn more about her and the stuff that she put out into the world because it's this fucking seems to be loads of it and it seems to have influenced so much of modern society realistically without anybody even seeming to know who who she is and, and what she's influenced. It's it's mad. It, it's proper interesting, but. In all honesty, I think to learn her teachings and her and everything that she she wrote about, realistically, that should be a, a paid job. Now, this isn't me being a shill. I'm not saying you know fucking wing me a five or and I'll read a book. I mean like that that's gonna take that's gonna take somebody years. Like there should be someone getting paid to research into all that side of stuff and spread it to the masses. But no, no fossils. Have ever been found though. You got to bear in mind that these Lemurians, the giant four-armed men of Lemuria, because unfortunately all of the fossils are underwater. And experts say that as soon as we dig down, you know, down there at the bottom of the ocean, the hole just gets fucking backfilled with water, which could explain why we rarely find any evidence of things hidden underneath a seabed. Anyway, let's have a song. This is "What's Golden" by Jurassic Five. If you're listening to this and you think to yourself, you know, oh, quite like this, maybe you'd like to see what I make out of dead rats as well, mate. There's a link below in the description. Wherever you're listening to this, you should find a link anyway, a link to If not, just uh, just search World Around You, the the name of the podcast, and you'll find all me on all my socials and that, mate. Give a uh, give a little go of Threshold.fm as well. You'll find loads of different radio shows there by loads of different people. Anyway, thanks for listening, man. I'll I'll let you get back to your show. Lemurian though it they didn't just get it didn't get plucked out of the ether though like the Polarians like the Polarians were kind of just plucked out of the ether in fact they kind of were the ether they were an ethereal being that they were the first root race according to Theosophy so the the species as I say was a was an ethereal being so what if they're still knocking about though and they're the real interdimensional species that are interacting with us and interacting with our world because if they've had since the earth was a like a fucking what do you know what do you describe like a primordial soup i think would be the most poetic way to describe it then surely they'll have evolved uh, and if they already had no corporeal form corporeal form corporeal form no physical form maybe they've evolved to move through like time and space you know because if they've not got a physical entity, then surely they can move around. But maybe the way that they are is physical to them. Maybe it's just in a different spectrum. I don't know. Words are escaping me this week. I'm gonna not going to lie, guys. This one was a fucking... Like, I spent a day researching this. And I'm gonna not going to... I'm not going to bullshit you. There's not a lot out there. But what if the Polarians, right? Maybe these are where souls, or our souls at least, come from. But maybe something happened to time itself, and now 
there are the souls of this species of the Polarians knocking about and now there's also our souls and they're trying to live side by side because maybe something happened to time or something happened to the timeline and and they are to like living with us as far as I'm aware from what I'm reading like they are doing to a degree but what if Ike says like what if what if you know, like David Icke, one of the things he says about the invisible reptilians that are holding onto our spines, if any of that is remotely true, then maybe we we are just the way for the ethereal entities to experience time and space again, to try and get back to what they knew. Maybe they're not evil at all, just in the same way that a PlayStation controller or a Nintendo Switch pad or a, a, a fucking Xbox controller, you know, I'm sure other games consoles are available. But just in the same way that them them controllers aren't evil, like ju- just if you just but if you only had that controller and didn't have a PlayStation and a PlayStation game, it'd be pointless. Like we'd never be able to do much with it, or or vice versa. If you only had the disc and the console and not the controller to use. You could maybe observe a very, very small window of what's available on that disc, but you wouldn't be able to interact with the rest of the disc. So maybe we're just the controllers for them, or maybe in a weird turn of a twist of fate, maybe we're controlling them, but we're not aware. Maybe there's something about us that has been evolved to in order to suck them into us, so that... You know, and then they're, they're stuck in there. And then we can use them to interact with time and space to maybe fix time and space to separate all of these different so-called root races of theosophy again so they'd separate them back throughout time. I'm not sure. Anyway, we'll get back to Lemuria. As a concept, it went out of fashion for about 101 years. Well, not, not about, it was 101 years. And then in 1912, Continental Drift came cruising over the horizon, didn't it? but in 2013, someone discovered an element called Xiron. Xiron, again. Another weird word, it's an element, so it could be pronounced as anything. I, I recently watched the programme and I saw that there was a French guy, could have sworn he was called Arnold, he was called something like Clan. Through me, proper through me, unless they made a problem with the, the captions, the, you know, with the subtitles, fuck knows. But anyway, that's completely off topic. Great programme though, it's called Surviving Death, definitely worth a watch. But we'll we'll get back into to Zyron. Now they found this Zyron in a place that had supposedly, uh, this place had only been accessible and existed, so called, for a few million years. But from what I've read about Zyron, that takes billions of years to form. So the timings were off. Somehow, this means scientists can say that there is a missing continent there, in that area, and and this continent, right? That continent there is Lemuria. It's pretty much Lemuria. They've just given it a new name. They've called it Mauritia. M-A-U-R-I-T-I-A. Now, there have been other underwater continents discovered and all, like Zealandia, and there was one called, again, forgive my pronunciation, a hell of a lot of owls, Kerguelen. Kerguelen. K-E-R-G-U-E-L-E-N. Kerguelen Plateau. Now, these probably have their own mythologies too, but I haven't actually looked into any of that because I was just sort of trying to be laser-focused, you know, on Lemuria. Another continent, though, that gets thrown around in these sort of ancient continental circles, if you if you want to call it that. I don't think anyone else does, but we will. The other continent is called Gond- Gondwana, or Gondwana. It could be, the W could be a V. I'll spell that one. Fuck it, I've spelled the rest. G-O-N-D-W-A-N-A. The idea, right, was that there's this super continent that everything was connected to that broke up because of the tectonic plate movements. But tectonic plate movements, right, that takes millions of years, if not billions of years, to be noticed. Like, you can't just constantly feel it moving, otherwise we'd all be going insane, wouldn't we? Like, just constantly shivering. Like, you know, like we're on a fucking... One of them vibrating platforms they have in the, some of them expensive shops. Like in... Uh, I, I remember them having one in Selfridges as a kid. You used to try and stand on it and, and go barefoot on it, see if it'd hurt your feet. Never really did. It's just a vibrating plate. Not interesting though either that, not interesting to anybody, wasn't even interesting to me at the time, I was just making the most of uh, hanging around with people that I, I don't think actually liked me, or oh, wanted to hang around with me, so I just entertained myself whilst in the company of others. Bit personal there guys, you know, throw us, a, throw us a, uh, an F in the in the chat or something on Discord, fuck knows. Either way, let's get <laughs> getting back to me notes. 
if they so the tectonic plates right they they would take billions a very long time to move but by having that as the cause for these continents moving and disappearing that completely almost completely removes the threat of an immediate and, and unavoidable danger in my opinion that's all science is about isn't it that's all science is science is about answering questions and a lot of the time once an answer has been found it seems like people who question it are then looked down on because we've then built the rest of science from that original fleck of so-called science like it's it's constantly builds on itself it eats itself don't it like 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 i think the word i've learned the word recently I did think it was another word, but I think it's... I keep seeing it getting thrown around on the internet all the time. Like Ouroboros. Like, fucking that snake that fucking chews its own tail, man. Like, that's what science is, isn't it? But what if science is just an art form? And it's, like, like in the same way that marketing is an art form. And it's... Or propaganda, you know. It's, it's a way of making people complacent. Unafraid because of science. Now... They feel that they understand it all. Everything that is there is to be understood, they think people understand. No one likes the unknown, and, and, and that's why people don't like the dark, innit? Say, saying that, though, I mean, I guess if, if that was true, if people, if everybody in the world was afraid of the unknown and the dark, then people wouldn't use glory holes, would they? So maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, when you see the videos of glory holes, it's always so well, well lit up, so they're not scared of the dark, but there is the unknown there. So, again, you know, I might be wrong, but... Making people believe anyway that the, the world as we as we knew it was destroyed slowly over time, rather than by some cataclysmic event that could strike at any given moment, or like you know whilst you're sleeping tonight maybe a meteorite could crash down at your kid's birthday party next week, a fucking a zombie could rise out the ground, a zombie dinosaur skeleton could rise out the ground and then that causes radiation to leak or because we found a bone underground that's heavily radiated from the meteorite that just spreads radiation and kills everyone in, in days or whilst you, you know, whilst your ball's deep in your girlfriend or even in a, in a, well, while you're with a sister, you know, a fire could engulf the world. You, you just don't know, like from solar flare activity or something, or one of them, like the like the fucking uh, Carrington event could happen again from the 1800s. You know, that's got to be due again, one of them solar flares, and that could set off all the fucking missiles, mate, the nuclear bombs could go off because of the fucking electrical mishap, like a little naturally occurring EMP. And all of a sudden, everything gets fried and just takes one missile to go up, and there'll, be, there'll always be one part of the world that survives, and they're like, oh, well, fuck that guy, press the button, blow them up, and then... You know, it, it it goes. You know what I mean? Like it's maybe, maybe that's that that could happen. You know, and and, and but people don't think about that, do they? You know, because there's no telling when a meteorite could strike realistically, and there's there's no way of telling when the next great flood will be. But think about it: if continental drift could happen, wouldn't the gaps between the continents give space for the water to shift into? Because why why would the water suddenly flood the world? And why are nearly all the other planets that we're aware of dry? Like, the water's got to have come from elsewhere. Otherwise, there'd just be ever-increasing and decreasing gaps between islands. Like, when they're in, like, fucking... People are swimming the Channel Tunnel. They're swimming the, the English Channel. You wouldn't swim the, ch the tunnel. But you, if you swam the Channel, that wouldn't be a summit you could hold as a record because that would be constantly changing. I mean, it does with the tides anyway. Maybe that's all tides are. Maybe we're told, you know, the tide comes in and out, but really what's happening there is the islands are constantly moving back and forth. What if it's the continent, the islands themselves that move and the sea stays still? Maybe that's why we've put the moon in the sky. We learnt that if we put the moon there, it holds all the water in place, which kind of protects the islands and just gets rid of a bit of the sand on the edge of the the, the, the countries you know on the on the borders and then as the islands move back and forth because obviously you know islands float in it everyone knows that uh, like um like a bit of like with them plastic islands you know that's where islands are formed all the plastic bottles from thousands and millions of years ago then dirt gathers on them like space dust and then life crops up a bit of moss you know and a fish lands on there and that gets eaten by a bird but the bird gets its foot trapped in there so a sea a sea lion comes and eats the seagull and then a, a killer whale comes and lands on there and eats the the sea lion and then that that killer whale's trapped now on that island of of, of uh, mossy plastic bottles and then that slowly evolves over time to to become a, a 15-foot Lemurian, perhaps. But 
like again getting back to uh, science, I guess. Um, if if these gaps were were real, well, I'm not disputing the sea is not real. I'm not saying that water is not real, but maybe the tides aren't real, and and that's why they're moving. That we're told that they're moving, so that we perceive it's just the tide coming back and forth. But really, we're getting like a few centimeters away, further and further away from France. But maybe the Earth's also like the universe, where everything's constantly moving away from the center of the Earth. So everyone's staying. It's kind of in proportionally. If you looked at it on a map over time or a satellite, it looks the same distance apart because everything's moved at once, possibly. But then, then again, when if the if the islands did split with continental drift, the continents did, and it was a valley, then there was, I suppose the water would fill that valley up. But then that would just mean that beaches would become lower in other parts of the world. But we're being told that sea levels are rising. It's a paradox, guys. So, so what if it's all about the wording, though? Like, seas themselves can be landlocked. So, what if those levels are rising? Because when the rain falls and fills the seas, the sea rises, right? But really, the oceans are dropping because the water's either being funneled under the plates through some form of like naturally occurring hose pipe, and, and that's why beaches can, can look so long. Or maybe like the ocean water evaporates, like we're told at school, and rains down into the mountains and the seas, and that fills the seas up and empties the oceans until them seas then grow to become a, a fucking the the seas grow into an ocean, and then before we know it, we've we've no longer got like the uh, the Dead Sea. It's then the 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 Dead Ocean and the Red Ocean. They'd probably I think they're quite close to each other, so that'd be the uh, Dead Dead Red Ocean, Dead Red Red Ocean. I don't know, there's got to be something there, someone will have something for that, but, and then the oceans shrink, so it becomes the Pacific Sea, and the North Atlantic Sea, because we've got loads more beach, then, and we can sell sheds, and deck chairs, and the whole new cottage industries arise from that, I mean, obviously this is all in the air, all hypothetical at the moment, like we just, we, we may never know, anyway, let's have another song, I assume we'll all know this one. This is Fandango by DJ Quick. So, after Phil named Lemuria, it wasn't for a few years till everyone became aware of it. And this seems like a test for later in the human timeline, because they took a then scientific finding, modern day pseudoscience as we would call it, and then they spread it to the masses. So... I was thinking, was this propaganda a way of changing science, a way to take the power away from the uneducated, or was it simply just a chain of unrelated events leading to it? Either way, in 1870, again, another fucking hard name, Ernst Hecht, which is spelt H-A-E-C-K-E-T, Ernst Hecht, claimed that Lemuria was the ancestral home of humans. A claim that I imagine was a... Uh, an ironic greenie in the face for the then Pope. Ironic because his name is Hucked. But, uh, and, and not just for the Pope though, for, but for many other religious leaders. Like Because the Catholics had spent fucking years trying to eradicate the ideas of old religions and the old philosophies and understandings of human history. And now suddenly one bloke is responsible for everybody hearing that instead of being made by God in a walled off garden somewhere, we instead evolved from a very advanced form of primitive being with six limbs because this was science and as far as I'm aware science had always been used to disprove folklore, magic and the supernatural so was or or is or is theosophy uh, I mean is was theosophy and if it's still being thought of today is it is that the way that very intelligent people could use science to break down the invisible cage that's been constructed around us by scientists and their science. Just as a little, little, uh, something to chew on in your mind for you there. But, can we use science to dismantle this new science? Because, as I said a minute ago, the, the Zircon, the Zircon, sorry, discovered was 3 billion years old, and Mauritia is believed to have disappeared 84 million years ago, but lemurs were discovered to have evolved in Madagascar 54 million years ago, so the maths doesn't work. Now, maths is supposed to be the universal language, but 
Who's told us that? Fucking scientists, me. They've made their own language to describe their own stories to further indoctrinate their own people. But that brings us to the here's how. Now, let's have a song, bit of a dark one, I'm not going to lie. This is uh, Constance by Mr. J. Madeiro. Now, I want to talk about the Lemurian egg layers for a minute. I was wondering if they sit on them like a chicken does, or whether they bury them like a turtle would. Then, I remembered about echidnas. Now, they're this mammal that lays eggs, sweats milk, and has a pouch. And it turns out that they carry their little leathery eggs inside of their pouch, so... I wonder if the Lemurian used to carry their eggs. Because I'm assuming both of them are mammals. Uh, you know, But we've got creatures now. Cause, uh, an echidna is a, is a mammal. And I'm assuming the Lemurians were also a mammal. Because mammals seem to have stemmed from them. Be it lemurs and humans. But at the minute we've got creatures now. Like the aforementioned chickens. That are birds. But their ancestors were reptiles. So maybe the Lemurians weren't actually mammals to start with. But let's presume they were what if that's where marsupials come from maybe the extra arms the lemurians had were mostly used to cradle their egg keeping it safe from ground dwelling predators and keeping it at body temperature by holding it close to its chest so maybe after millions of years these creatures put a lot of their evolutionary stock into growing a pouch to hold their eggs in and having survived for millions of years through seven stages of so-called subspecies with four arms but only ever using two at a time for activities then Maybe it makes sense for them to lose their other arms. Maybe when you've got four arms, you'll have your, your two dominant hands. Like when you've got two hands, you've got one dominant hand. You know what I mean? So maybe, for for example, like the their upper left and lower right, leaving the other two hands that they've got only good for, for egg holding. Just like in humans, how, you know, as I say, you've got that dominant right hand. Now, I know that when I, when I type on a keyboard, for example, just to, you know, uh, illustrate my point, when I when I type on a keyboard, I'll use like four fingers on my right hand and probably only the middle finger of my left hand for maybe the E, D and the S key. I'll probably even maybe even, you know, slide over to the to the A key the A key. And, you know, sometimes I'll use my little what would be the I think is the ring finger, the finger next to your pinky on your left hand. Might even use that for the shift button, but never at the same time. No, I, I, I can't even really, a bit too much information quite possibly, but I can't even really wipe my ass without it feeling like I've somehow missed my target with me with my left hand or, you know, which you don't want to do because then you're just worried about smearing shit up the inside of your ass crack rather than simply rubbing it away or rubbing it back into your bum hole. Anyway, marsupials are, are mainly found in Australasia, which is also where these echidnas are found. So what... What evidence is there that exists out there that Lemurian people ended up in Australasia? You'll be surprised to find out that there is actually some evidence of that. Now, if you read about the root races, which I mentioned earlier on, which I'll so try and summarise quickly. Again, they're, they're, they're the seven... They're, they're the seven races of past and present creatures that seem to have made up and will make up history as according to theosophy. Risky territory now, because we're talking about races and that, but... I will go into these in another episode when I've got a better understanding of them, but Helena Blavatsky suggested there are these five races and that there's going to be another two. The next one's not going to show itself until the 28th century, and others have suggested that these peoples will inhabit a land called Bensalem, B-E-N-S-A-L-E-M, Salem like the witches, Ben like the name. And... I've only scratched the tip of the iceberg with this, as I say, with, with these, though. And, and honestly, honestly, I'd never heard of these root races until today. But interestingly, the list suggests that the Lemurians left Lemuria due to volcanic eruptions and colonised various parts of the world, like the East Indies. But one of these races are categorised as, uh, possibly categorised as a problematic name, maybe, um... And if for some reason this is offensive, it's not intended to be. This is literally what they were called. They're the Australoid race. A-U-S-T-R-A-L-O-I-D. But this implies that this race lived in Australasia. And from a quick skim read of it, as I say, I'm saving it for another week. I think they did live there. So what if these six-armed 
Lemurians evolved to become kangaroos. Because kangaroos are thought to have five limbs because of the strength of the tail and the manner in which that they use the tail to run. And they also birthed the young into a pouch. So maybe a kangaroo, they only lost one arm through evolution. And kangaroos get pretty big as well, innit? Like, I know Helena Blavatsky said that Lemurians are the ancestors of the humans, but... I fear she also means spiritual ancestor, as in our souls came from the Lemurians, much in the same way that they believe the leader of the 28th century people will be inhabited by the soul of the, the very long since dead Julius Caesar. Plus, it's widely accepted that dinosaurs became the modern day chickens amongst billions of other species that didn't quite make it to today. So maybe these four-armed humanoids were outsmarted or killed for their meat, because being 15 foot tall would probably mean there's a, a lot of food on there, innit? But I guess over the millions of years, due to the chemicals that have been constantly changing in our air, the trees have shrunk, and, and so have the animals, so maybe that's why they shrunk down to the size of a regular kangaroo. But some people don't even believe in dinosaurs, mate. Instead, they claim that it's modern scientists and their way of hiding the fact that giants inhabited the earth before us. And if you don't want people to know that there was once four-armed, 15-foot humans, then the best way to, to sort that out would be to rearrange their skeletons into a fucking T-Rex, mate, because that's still pretty big. I mean, I think they're bigger than 15 foot tall, because, and that's because they've used uh, pretty much like fucking three arms, the equivalent of three arms to add height to it, or, or to add the tail. Like a T-Rex's arms are kind of half the length of a Lemurian's arm, in my imagination at least, because they're just little stumpy things, aren't they? So that's an extra half of an arm. They've got the two spare arms and then half of each arm to, to shorten the arms down. And, and then, you know, add it into, you know, you get them and then you could add it into the tail, the spine, into the rib cage, you know, or you could just simply use it to extend the legs through. And those extra finger bones as well, they could easily make up some extra teeth. Like they make, you know, use the little bones to make them, chop them in half and make them look like molars and really fuck up the like science world of dinosaurs, you know. It, it kind of, it, it, it's just a thought in it, but it does kind of, to me it makes sense. I don't know how you used to feel about it. Now I think it's weird how when I have researched this, uh, I have to decide at the beginning of this one really what, what I'm going to believe because otherwise it makes the research almost impossible. Because if you go into this, this was one of them topics where if you go into it uh, oh, really open-minded, then you're just going to be running around in circles because it's impossible to believe the science, the history, the ancient history, the YouTube conspiracy theorists, and also to believe the alternative history timeline. So you've got to kind of take one of them as gospel for this and then run with it with the research. So that's why I think everyone can get a completely different point of view on this. I kind of took the 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 mantle of let's not believe science for this one and it kind of allows the others to fit in place. Whereas if you was to say let's not believe history, then you can believe science. You could possibly believe ancient history. You could maybe believe the YouTube conspiracy theories, but you can't, but they disprove everything. Everything basically just disproves everything else with it. With this one, so it's very, very weird. But you get what I mean. Like you, you don't want to... The whole thing, the whole episode this week would have just been a me arguing with myself with completely opposing points. And no, I don't think anyone wants to hear that, do they? Like, who wants to just hear me rattling off to myself and getting like wound up with it all and I, I couldn't I, I even from my notes when I went through made me notes I couldn't I couldn't do it me I couldn't fucking put it together and I honestly honestly guys I don't know what I believe about this because I, I don't know if I think there are millions of Machamp fossils hidden buried beneath the Indian Ocean I do believe continents have disappeared because we can see erosion ruining coastal towns right now. Right this very second you could go to a, a coastal town and watch sand or rocks drop off the edge every couple hours. So it makes sense in a way. Continental drift to me feels like a way of stopping people from being scared at the end of the world because I think if everyone realised that if a, if a meteorite could hit us at any moment or if the sun could go out or the earth could simply explode or the poles could shift or even the moon could run out of fuel and smash into the side of the earth or just simply it's refueled, finally refueled from the sun and it just flies away. If people could realise all of this was possible at any, any given moment, then I don't think people would really go to work anymore. Society would fall apart, innit? And, and the 1800s and 1900s 
from my understanding of it at least, their best export of that time period's best export to the future feels like society. Like maybe not the way they had society, but the concept of society seems to have come around in those times. And maybe that we have the eradication of folklore and un, you know and the non-uniform beliefs to thank for that. Maybe that's where society can come from, from eradicating the the ideas of different people kind of thing. You know, we're like, no, I don't believe that. Everyone needs to believe this. And, and another point, though, before we end that I should make, is that that makes me disbelieve science as we know it. It's, it's one of the reasons why uh, scientists don't believe in Lemuria. And it's because I read that scientists believe that Liam has evolved on Madagascar around 54 million years ago, right? after initially swimming to the island from mainland Africa. And that seems like you're, you're a kid. You know, you're know you in the car and you're, you're looking round and you look up at the sky and you're about four or five and you're like, Dad, why is the sky blue? And he gives you some bullshit answer. He doesn't know why, but he knows that if he doesn't give you an answer, then you're going to start to doubt everything he says. And you're too young to be doubting what he says. So how can we be sure that science isn't simply just a religion? A heavily disguised religion with its own prophets and laws. I guess we can't, but the stories of Lemuria kind of have a crossover with the Indian stories of Kumari Kandam. Maybe less of, of a crossover and, and more of it being picked up by certain scholars and then having the information from it being assigned to references from their history to make it seem like it had been around for longer, possibly. I mean, no way an expert, though, but from reading what I have, it seems Lemuria came about in the late 1800s, and then over the next 150 years, it was adapted all around the world to fit various stories and nations. Now, you know who does have an interest in making the whole world believe one story, though? The Illuminati, the Enlightened, the New World Order. And you know what else they're into in a fucking big way, mate? Triangles. They love a triangle. It's the strongest shape there is. And that's what shape Lemuria or Mauritia was said to be. So why would a triangular continent get washed away? Maybe a triangle is strong if it's in an artificial structure or in a societal or hierarchical structure. But in nature, I can't think of that many strong triangles. The Bermuda Triangle, to be fair, is pretty strong. That can fucking just delete things out of existence. But uh, And the Wald Newton Triangle, that was pretty interesting. Not that strong, but interesting. Definitely, you know. But, I, like I said, I don't know if they're that strong. Carrots are kind of triangular, but they're only strong in one direction. And I, I'm not trying to show off, guys, but even I can snap a carrot. So what if the New World Order was trying to indoctrinate the world to the idea of a triangle being the cradle of civilization, so that it'd be easier to believe in a triangle that claims to be the future of civilization? Because like, I'm no historian, as, you, as you're bound to be aware, but wasn't England heavily influencing that part of the world where Lemuria was said to be up until around like the mid 1900s and maybe even to this day maybe I'm just ignorant but and, and from the mid 1800s to mid 1900s this story of Lemuria seemed to thrive and the way it was used to facilitate what seems like a a totally new legend in the late 1800s all around the world seems a little bit suspect really uh, but maybe that's just what happens Maybe good ideas tend to all happen at a similar time because the cultural and scientific happenings lead equally intelligent people to make the same conclusions. Anyway, that's it from me. I'll see you in a bit.